and thank you also for being here and for, uh, for inviting me over. Uh, so I'm going to explain what I mean with this uh, title, It Matters What Design Designs Design. Uh, later in the talk, it's actually a paraphrase from a philosopher called Donna Haraway, so we'll get to that. And also to connect to the previous talk, this image is from a, also from a video game called Never Alone, in case you want to look that up. I think it's also a very nice interpretation of a multi-species world that is told uh, through the medium of the video game. And it's done very well, so I suggest to check that out. Uh, so it's very nice to meet you and to be part of this conference. Uh, I spend most of my time these days indoors writing my thesis. So it's really nice to be outside and see people uh, for a while. So thank you. I'm originally from the Netherlands and I am living in uh, Sweden, in Malmo in the south, where I'm finishing up my PhD in interaction design. Uh, at Malmo University. So the title of my thesis is Imagining Multi-Species Worlds, and I'm focusing on the relationships between humans and other animals um, in the field of interaction design. So this talk will have uh, three sections. The, in the first one, I'm going to talk about the meaning of designing and how I see that uh, meaning. And the second talk is going to be, um, the second uh, part of this talk is going to be about uh, designing with other animals. And yes, those are three penguins playing a video game, so we're going to get to that too. <laughs> and the third section is going to conclude the previous two, and here I will try to articulate like, how we can imagine those multi-species wor worlds. So let's get into this. I think this is a great design example also. Um, so I will now try to convince you to transform your uh, understanding of what design or the notion of design means towards seeing it as a practice of negotiating possibilities. So here are some uh, traditional definitions of, of the word design or the practice of design. Many of these definitions are still uh, used today, but I suggest that you start to question them together with me and see what works for you and what doesn't. So one very persistent definition is the understanding that designers are there to solve problems, right? A designer is someone who devises courses of actions aimed at changing existing situations into preferred one. But then the follow-up question, of course, is like whose, whose preferences are we designing for? Uh, whose situations are we changing? Like, whose problem are we trying to solve and whose problems are we thereby uh, actually creating? And then later, during the 80s design, uh, and later as well, during design definitions became a little more centered around users and humans rather than the artifacts themselves. So we got notions like user-centered design and later also human-centered design. But of course, when I do my research with design and other animals, then I'm starting to question, question that idea of human-centered design as well. I think that nowadays some people have also started to uh, refer to planet-centered design to try to broaden that uh, again. And then during the 90s, the definition shifted again, and design was seen as initiating change in man-made things. But we've seen also today with the presentation of Jakob that animals are doing a lot of, you know, working with tools, playing and designing. So it's not only like man-made things that uh, design is impacting. So although these definitions are always ever evolving, the focus is very much around like the, the, the ability of the designer to do stuff, to control stuff, to solve things, to change something, to initiate something. And so I will try to argue why this is not enough. Because in this billion dollar industry that we call design, like who is actually benefiting from all these inventions, right? And the changes that we initiate, such as here in the case of technology, perhaps, where uh, companies may focus on growing bigger or making increasing amounts of money, but we can also focus on all kinds of other impacts that uh, design work has, right? You can think about uh, gig uh, economies or worker exploitations or adding stuff to the world that nobody really needs. Uh, these are just some images of a protest in Barcelona where the original residents of especially the central uh, area are claiming like Barcelona is not for sale, where companies like Airbnb uh, have turned the city into like a hotel and it's impossible to live there as the local residents, right? So if we are uh, f doing design that focus on the, on the users, then perhaps we are only focusing on the tourists and not on all the other stakeholders involved. And another set of examples is where design is like either consciously or unconsciously used to actually reinforce oppressive structures. So when we mean human or user-centered design, in a lot of cases, this is meant as like a, a white or a male or an able-bodied uh, human. And we are ignoring kind of other, other kinds of, of people. And this is not only about uh, technologies, this is also like about um, a lot of design projects and efforts in which like the privileged white people 
go into poor neighborhoods or other countries to try and fix other people's problems, right? Where we rarely invite people from these neighborhoods to come and fix our problems. Um, and so there seems to be like a general assumption in the field of design that we can control and fix things for other beings uh, and also make money out of this practice, which uh, you can see as a kind of colonialist idea to enter s into something and change something. Uh, so these are just two resources that you can dive into if you'd like to know more about these topics. One is a, a design community called Decolonizing Design and the other one is a, is a book. All the references that I have so far mentioned, they're also going to be at the end of the talk in a list, so you can get them from there too. So the idea that we can produce design to, to solve things also brings me to the third and the last example here of why these definitions of design are perhaps not so helpful, which is the state of our planet, of course. Like, why are we producing more stuff? And why also do we think that we as humans, the ones that are causing these issues, are the ones that can be solving it? Like, that we can just design our way out of it with more design that has actually led us into this, right? So I think it's very crucial that we understand as designers our, uh, our relations to these issues. And perhaps it's also time to say that maybe it's not enough anymore that we simply make our clients or customers happy. Maybe we need to look at the, the wider impact of our, our designs. So I think that's important to accept that design is more than the user and more than solving a problem. So I want to bring in some more recent uh, alternative definition of design that perhaps are, are more helpful. So here there are some uh, theorists that say design can also be understood as a series of negotiation or negotiated uh, achievements or even a material form of doing ethics. And uh, lastly, a process of negoti negotiation with the given which extends the boundaries of the previously possible. So do you see the difference here with what these theories are trying to propose? Instead of claiming to like control something or fix something or change something, these definitions take a little bit more humble position as a, as a designers and sees it, sees it more as a process of negotiation. So here, in this kind of definition, we can allow for the space in which designers accept that they cannot always control the impact of their work, but they're nonetheless uh, ethically involved and responsible for what they put out there. So I'm summarizing this in my research uh, as follows, to see designing as um, negotiating possibilities, right? So here, first of all, designing, it's a verb, right? It's an activity we design or, or to design. Uh, and this implies that it's an active process of making or constructing or also a deliberate unmaking of situations, right? And then secondly, there is this ethical dimension to design that involves a responsibility and an accountability for the particular view that is put forward in design work. So rather than attempting to design from like an all-knowing or universal uh, perspectives, designers always come in and they propose a view from somewhere. Uh, and this always makes design like a non-innocent activity because you go in and you do stuff from your particular perspective. So when you negotiate, you take a certain position. Instead of claiming to be like a neutral person, you actually acknowledge that we are bringing in a certain perspective. And this is never like an objective or neutral thing to do, but always something that is subjective and in fact negotiable. And then thirdly, the idea that we negotiate it means that there needs to be something to negotiate with, right? Something needs to be at stake. A possibility needs to be present. If there's no possibility to negotiate something, we, we feel very stuck as designers. Um, and this brings me in, into the next argument for this first section, because now, so far, I have I've only been pointing out problems, right? Which is what academics often do. Uh, they, they go in and critique the status quo. And I think that this is a very dangerous thing to do uh, as a designer, because only like raising problems can be paralyzing. Uh, it can like actually cause like a lack of imagination, and it can even like make us fall into despair because we don't know what to do anymore. So people that are into like activism or critical theory, they bring up these kind of terms, which I think are uh, super useful when we are trying to understand certain situations or end certain practices or fight against something. But if we look closer at these kind of terms, we can see that they're actually describing only what they are not or what they are against. So I'm arguing that these are not possibilities, but they're endings, right? So here there is a, a, a well-known American philosopher uh, who features a lot in my research. Her name is uh, Donna Haraway, and I think she's a very important philosopher of our time. 
and uh, she writes that it matters what thoughts think thoughts, it matters what knowledges know knowledges, it matters what relations relate relations, it matters what worlds world worlds, and it matters what stories tell stories. So the kinds of the thoughts, the knowledge, the relations, the worlds, and the stories that we can come up with are always a result of the perspectives that we already have. So therefore, of course, I extended this into, into design. I'm saying it matters what designs design design. So inspiration from design comes always from the way that we view the world already and the perspectives that we often like unconsciously already assume. So it's our worldview that inspires. So new ideas are shaped around ideas that we already have. And so this makes it crucial to consider and question the initial perspectives that we used to design with. And therefore I'm saying that these kind of words that I just like showed are very difficult to design with because they're saying what they are not, right? Like imagine, you get a design brief, it's like, can you please design me a non-racist artificial intelligence? And this makes, of course, a lot of sense. We want those kind of artificial intelligence. It seems like a very reasonable thing to do. But it's also like asking somebody to design like a non-chair or a non-app. Uh, it doesn't give you a lot to work with, right? By only saying what it is not. So perhaps these kind of words are getting a little bit more helpful, trying to propose something instead of saying what it's not. We can think of things like sustainable design or circular economy or a caring design, but still like it's up to us as designer to do something with this word, right? To, to create openings with them, to use them to help us to imagine what that would actually mean and to rephrase those things in any way that you find inspiring as a designer, uh, to tell stories with them and to let them transform into other like more helpful things. Uh, so as a kind of takeaway from this first section, my questions for you as uh, things to maybe take with you is what are the designs that give rise to your designs? And then by extension, like what are the possibilities that you are willing to negotiate with in, in your work? So this was a kind of setting the stage because I'm going to refer back to these things in a moment because I found, uh, uh, I found these things through my PhD work as well, right? So it's time to turn towards uh, other animals and try to apply this way of understanding design to that more like specific angle of designing with other, other animals. So who of you in this audience has ever heard of the term speciesism before this talk? I see a few hands, but it's not a very familiar word, so I'm going to explain what this is, so don't worry about that. Um, so speciesism actually is a term that is used to describe a form of discrimination that is based on the grounds of belonging to the to a certain species. So it usually refers to the way in which human animals oppress, exploit, abuse, or kill other animals. And it was popularized by Peter Singer, who is an Australian uh, philosopher. In uh, 1975, he wrote a book called uh, Animal Liberation. And here he argues that discrimination on the grounds of belonging to a certain species is wrong. So giving more value to a human being, he says, is not more justified than discrimination based on gender or class or skin color. So he's actually trying to align the term speciesism with other forms of oppression, right? To put it on the agenda aside to these things, such as like classism, sexism, racism. So we have speciesism as well. And if we look at the uh, sheer like numbers of victim, actually we could say that speciesism can be considered the most systemic, the most deadly and the most all encompassing form of violence that currently exists. And it's also completely normalized in, in most societies, right? We don't really question it a lot. Um, so we, if we look at the numbers, then we have like about more than 150 billion animals that are killed for consumption only each year by humans. So this figure doesn't yet include any species that are killed for research or kept alive and enslaved in like dairy and egg farms or caged for human entertainment. So if you are not familiar with this term or you're kind of confused right now and you want to know more, I suggest this documentary. Uh, it's called Speciesism the Movie. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of documentaries out there about like animal rights and things like this. Uh, this one is particularly focused on this notion of speciesism and how this argument that Peter Singer is actually trying to uh, uh, popularize, how this actually um, breaks down. So I started with that, it, that sort of large-scale issue in my research, and then I started working with these kind of design questions. So what could a world without speciesism actually look like? How can we engage with one another in, in such a world? What do we eat? Uh, 
do humans share the same spaces with other animals? Like, how do we think about the violence that actually inevitably will occur between animals? So these are some of the big questions. So if speciesism is something that is so normalized and so like all encompassing, how can we actually imagine, uh, you know, and start to engage with these things if it's already very hard for most people to imagine what to have for dinner without having other animals uh, involved? Uh, and of course, I cannot find like specific answers to these questions, right? Because they're quite kind of large. Nobody knows for sure what this w could look like. Um, but what we can do is think about like how designers may go about thinking with these quest with these questions in the negotiations that they are involved in. So during the first few years of my PhD, I was trying to imagine what is non-speciesism, what could it be like, and obviously I was getting super stuck with that, right? Because as I just described, I was only thinking about what it's not by saying non-speciesism. And since that is like, speciesism is almost everywhere, it was, I didn't know where to start with this. So I started to like rephrase it to avoid to get stuck in this like critical like negation uh, mode. Um, and so when it matters what designs, design, designs, I started thinking like maybe we need to actually look at the already existing traces of these multi-species worlds that we can find. So this is like places and situations in the world where multi-species relations, by which then I mean like the opposite of speciesist relations already exist. Because perhaps by identifying those traces, we can start to get an idea of what this multi-species world actually could mean. And so while I was um, uh, thinking of these traces, I had already been involved in designing interactions with other animals for several years. So it, I kind of started to catch up with the theory while I was already involved in design projects. Um, so one of the places in which I found an opening in multi-species relationships with other animals is in playfulness. So this is a short video that shows some of the playtesting we were doing when we prototyped the tablet game that you can play both with the cat and the human simultaneously and try to see how can we create a game that can give space to both the cat and the human to participate in the game and meet each other in play. Because I think there is something special happening in play when two beings meet each other. And this is because both of us like, engage in the shared aspects of curiosity, affection, and responding to each other and creating a kind of shared understanding of how the play evolves. <laughs> And nowadays we find uh, quite some design work that uh, explores like this idea of shared playfulness between humans and animals. And in some cases, these can even like subvert norms, right? So this drawing uh, is inspired from a, a project called Playing with Pigs, which was carried out in the, in the Netherlands by a combination of HKU and Wageningen University, where they responded to a design brief of providing toys in pig sheds. So this became like a mandatory requirement in the, in the in the EU because they found that pigs are getting bored and they're biting each other's tails off. So then the solution was that pigs need to have toys in their shed. Um, and then at the same time, like this investigation and trying to prototype how you could play uh, games with, with pigs also uh, revealed like this absurdity of what it would mean to play a, a game with your own potential meat, right? or to negotiate between like befriending another animal in play versus farming them as a mere like resource. And what this then can actually tell us about more respectful uh, relationship that we can potentially have with pigs. So I started like making these small sort of badly drawn uh, annotated illustrations as part of my research uh, because I wanted to capture these, uh, these traces of multi-species uh, relations that I found and I couldn't really express them very easily in, in human language, right? So in other words, like I wanted to make a kind of repertoire that I could then maybe use as a, as a starting point for design or to inspire other designs. So this is another one where like, as you can see in the video, I'm like so obsessed with this actual artifact that I put there and if the cat will like it or not. Uh, so, and this is of course what we do, like we develop something, we really care about the artifact that we put out there. Um, but I see this also as a trace of, of these kind of rela multi-species relations because of course there's an amount of care that you put into providing something for another animal that they might find actually interesting to, uh, to engage with. And then in another design project, I, uh, or several design projects, I work with designing playful artifacts for dogs. And here I wanted to take that like 
uh, making aspect a little bit further. So over the last years, I have done like many different small design projects, actually with my own two dogs. I don't have the time now to share like a lot of uh, pictures of those, but at the end of the talk, there was a link to the blog where you can see all of them. And it's also like all like uh, open uh, source stuff that you can, uh, if you have dogs, maybe you want to try out something. Um, so what I took with me from this project is that in order to design something together, like we must actually take each other quite seriously. I must take the idea that the dog will have something to say about my design quite seriously. Uh, and to be open to the possibility that animals can actually tell us their preferences without using human, uh, human language and to be actually willing to speculate with them and to take risks together, even though you might fail, of course, and engage in this like thinking through making process together. So then after like a couple of years of very comfortable design with pets, I wanted to challenge this idea that we can then only design and rethink relationship with animals that we are already friends with or that already live in our homes. Because of course, like if we really want to find a, a counter concept to speciesism, we're gonna have to think a lot broader than, uh, than human pet relationships. So I wanted to engage in a design project with the kind of animals that we, are, that we are very familiar with, but we don't really usually relate to them. So then I obtained a colony of black ants, and I initially tried to convince my boss at the university that it was uh, going to be a very good idea if I had them on my desk at the university, because I wanted to involve the other uh, colleagues. And she said, okay, that's okay, but please make sure that they don't escape. So I got this nest, so it looked, it looked like this, uh, with a nest on the, on the left, and then a kind of outside area and feeding supplies, uh, and then I got like one queen ant and eight uh, worker ants. And then several weeks later, I had like a bunch of ants crawling all around the desk everywhere because of course they had escaped. So first I didn't really understand how they managed to do this, and then I started to follow them around for a little bit, and I discovered that they had found this opening between these two layers of plexiglass in that like box on the right, and they had actually like m crawl out, find some pieces of carton that were like on other parts of my desk. They stacked that into that opening and so that it could stay open, they could walk in and out with whatever they found and could bring it back very comfortably. So I didn't know what to do. Initially, like I wanted to close it again because I promised the boss that I wouldn't uh, have them uh, escape, but then I felt bad about it too because I mean, I just wanted to provide them also with that space, right? So then with this story uh, in mind, I organized like a design workshop and it was, yeah, it was kind of like a game jam. So five groups were participated and they prototyped escape rooms uh, for ants. So escape rooms, if you don't know, they are like this live action uh, game where you're like locked inside a room and you need to solve some puzzles to escape. Uh, so I wanted to see particularly if the if the participants would like start to rethink their relationship with ants while they were engaging with this design challenge, right? Uh, so one of the prototypes is on the, the bottom uh, left. So can, I can explain shortly how it works, so the, their idea of how it works, uh, which is that the ant comes in from this tube at the bottom from the, uh, from the nest, and then they have to, f to find like which of these black rope leads to the kind of area on the top, uh, the longest one, of course, and then they have to push like a ball through a tube that's gonna fall down and it's gonna like switch this like seesaw and then the ant can like reach the kind of a straw and crawl out through the through that through the other exit on the back. Um, and later, the the ants tried out all of these uh, five rooms, and this pro this process was like live streamed on Twitch, which is like this video streaming uh, channel, which also generated like a lot of discussion of like how, why and how and this is cruel. Um, and actually they managed to do this, like they, they didn't push the ball through, but all the other parts of their intended design, they, they followed, the ants followed through with this. Uh, so these are some of like the reflections that I gathered from the workshop. So these are some of the answers to a survey from the workshop uh, participants. And most of them were indeed like reconsidering like what do ants actually like to do? And they speculated on the possibility for them to be maybe even like curious or playful. Um, and also they were concerned with this inherent cruelty like that, that is involved with this whole thing, right? Because isn't it kind of cruel to take an ant, capture them, and then design escape, escape rooms uh, for them? So all of this, like, including me, if reflected extensively on the well-being of this small ant colony, a type of animal that we had never been really concerned with before. So what I took away from this project that is that there is a very real change in our like attention and responsiveness to the world around us. Uh, 
through doing these kind of uh, projects. So design also changes us, right? It changes our worldviews. It changes like what we may see as good or bad, or, uh, or and it allows us to pay attention to new things. Uh, and I think we can use this kind of attentiveness and responsiveness that we're training with design to also imagine those multi-species worlds. Because now, of course, every time I, s I see an ant somewhere, I'm much more curious to see like where are they actually going and what are they doing. Um, and I received a couple of uh, uh, replies from a later survey with the participants of the workshop that were also saying that they had met ants later and they were trying to figure out you know, new ways of responding to them. So then while I was still busy with those ants, I also got in touch with an aquarium somewhere in the US. Um, I, I will like, uh, let them re remain anonymous for now. And because it appeared that their colony of Magellanic penguins like many zoo animals these days, apparently, were interested in video games, in tablet screen games. Uh, so I met up with them and I watched them play one of these. Actually, there was like a game designed for cats, right? And the penguins were much better at it, by the way. They, they had much higher scores than the cats did. So they play very differently, right? And then I was asked like, to design something playful for the, for the penguins specifically so that they didn't have to play cat games, but maybe they could play penguin games. And I had a problem with this because I'm like very critical of zoos. I think that they are some like colonialist projects and I don't see them like being very beneficial to the lives of other animals. But I also thought like, okay, perhaps these penguins could help me in rethinking what, the, what could be like a multi-species zoo. Like, is that something that could exist? Um, and also perhaps in line with what I found with the dogs and the ants, like if the penguins would participate, maybe I would be able to, to, to get some new ideas from them, right? So for one year I tried to come up with ideas for penguin toys and uh, while thinking about this idea of multi-speciesism in relation to the zoo animals. So these are some image of images of the toy design projects that we did with the master students in uh, interaction design in Sweden. So they helped me a lot with coming up with speculations of what kind of toys penguins might be, uh, might be interested in and created some, some prototypes from there and then shipped them to the, to the US one year later. So here's like a picture and I don't know why, I'm trying to explain to this penguin how this toy works or something, I don't, uh, I don't know. This situation was very complex because there was uh, the zookeeper who really, of course, is very involved and cares deeply about the animals that she's interacting with every day. Uh, and she wanted to find out ways to care about these animals in the best way possible. Then there was also the zookeepers like watching and they bought their ticket, so they came to see the penguins play, right? And I was also very, scared that the penguins would like hurt themselves with the toys that I put there uh, in front of the uh, visitors. And then there was like the PR department of the, of, of the university that I was uh, uh, affiliated with when I was there that also wanted to get kind of like a good story out of this whole thing. So it was really difficult to talk to the penguins about speciesism while all of this was, was going on. So I wasn't particularly like successful, I think, in this project, but I still wanted to share it with you because I think this is a situation that many designers deal with. Uh, maybe not with penguins necessarily, but we are always negotiating with different stakeholders. And it's very easy to start like prioritizing one uh, stakeholder demand over the other because perhaps they, they are the ones paying or they are the humans that talk in a human uh, language, right? So it's very easy to get stuck in this like super complex situation where it's not at all clear uh, what is the right thing to do. But of course also multi-species stuff was happening. So in re-watching these uh, videos over and over again, first I was like focusing on how uh, these penguins interacted with the prototype that I was putting out there. But then I found that the penguins were telling like all kinds of other uh, stories that they, for example, like wh while we were very busy testing out the, uh, the prototype, in the meantime, three other penguins had decided to like sneak into the supply closet and check out like what's, uh, you know, what's in there and investigate all the stuff there. So these penguins are like super inventive, very curious, and also very funny. Like they come up with their own things to do all the time, right? And then here, like I was trying to like explain the prototype to the, to the penguin and then my assistant for that day was trying to get everything on camera and trying to stand like super still, not to distract any attention. And of course this penguin was just like, why are you standing there so still? So he was like chewing on his pants and shoes while he was trying to focus on the, on the design work. So also here we can see that while we as designers, we try to negotiate things in very particular directions and then our, our participants, I would say, especially penguins, they, they try to negotiate us into all of different um, 
uh, directions as well. So this is also one of those traces perhaps of those multi-species world, to see these negotiations that the other animals are, are doing and to take them seriously and to adapt our designs accordingly. So as a takeaway for the second section, I, I hope that I could convince you that these uh, design negotiations with other animals, first of all, they never go as planned. So it's only, I think it's only by being really open to these surprises and this uncertainty and by taking those seriously that we can find less species and more multi-species way of engaging with other animals. And secondly, I also think that these stories are always small. I cannot give you any like general conclusions on how to design uh, with other animals, apart from saying that each individual animal will have their own stories to tell. So it's only by finding ways to listen to those stories that we can really negotiate our designs with other animals and find alternative ideas for maybe more desirable futures with them. So then the third section. Have you seen this uh, video of an octopus that might be dreaming? It was going like viral a couple of weeks ago. So this is an animal that doesn't have a brain structure that is in any way similar to that of other mammals. And yet it may be dreaming, right? So speaking of multi-species imagination, I think that's fascinating. So anyway, to move towards like a conclusion for this talk, how can we imagine uh, multi-species worlds? So how can we design the designs that inspire other designs in the context of multi-speciesism? So the projects that I discussed, they were like deliberately set out to design with other animals. And uh, most importantly also, they never really managed to like fully escape this speciesism either, right? Because it was working with pets that we have domesticated. I was working with zoos or ants in captivity, uh, but still trying to find those traces within these projects. But I think that we can take this idea of finding traces uh, much uh, closer to home as well and in our everyday situation because we encounter other animals all the time. So in our daily life we might have like many of these moments with other animals that can help us also think about this multi-species world. For example in this case like when an insect gets stuck behind the window we might open the door and let them out right that is like a very small uh, um, moment uh, where we can think about our relation to the other animal and what, our dis what kind of impact our decision uh, have. And perhaps we can extend this, like why, why are glass structures designed, why are the, the glass structures designed in a way that they make animal stocks? Can we, can we question this? Can we think of other ideas as well? Or we can think of like public spaces as well. So how are public spaces actually designed to accommodate or help other animals uh, that are living in the cities with us? So not just looking uh, at them as pests or like chasing them away, but actively designing cohabitations with humans where, wherever this is appropriate. And sometimes we can also encounter other animals by surprise. So multi-species imaginations can also involve danger, like it's not always something that is beautiful and, and uh, affectionate, right? It can also involve things like dangerous meetings, encounters, or even death, right? So here we can see that sometimes actually maintaining distance or leaving animal, other animals alone is the most multi-species thing to do as well. Or like other animals that are actually involving us in their own uh, like kind of paths of destruction. So, and we can also try to negotiate those situations. So this is a story from a, a vegan friend who has a cat. And this cat is like bringing home dead birds and then putting them at her uh, feet. Uh, and she's like, maybe he wants to give me these things, but I don't really want them. <laughs> and I, she's trying to like explain to this cat that she doesn't like this and if he can please stop doing that. But and so that is also like a negotiation to, uh, to work with here. And of course, it's not only other animals that can help us imagine multi-species world. Actually, if we're talking about living species, 83% of those species are actually plant life. Um, so he even here, we can in some ways like understand the interests of other species. We can see and perhaps even empathize with a thirsty plant hanging out, uh, down uh, its leaves, for example. So in all of this, I think it's very important that we look at small scenarios and everyday experiences rather than like attempt to think about big solutions or far like fetched utopia that we can't imagine these, these days. So when animal oppression is something that is so normalized and so overwhelming and literally present in almost every uh, place that we look, we can still find those small traces of different or alternative or more desirable relationship with animals. And I think that those are the places that can inspire designers to think of multi-species futures. 
So rather than saying that we have reached like the ending of this talk and offering you a kind of summary or conclusion that kind of brings it all together, I want to leave you more with like an opening rather than a closing. So all I can say is that design takes place in the possibilities that are already here. And so designing the future starts with negotiating the possibilities that already exist in the here and now. Thank you very much. <laughs>